Thanks, Ben, and good morning. My, I'm Shamia Fagan, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am honored to serve as Oregon's 28th Secretary of State. Our mission at the Oregon Secretary of State's office is to build trust, to build trust between the people of Oregon and their state government so that Oregonians trust the public services that can make a positive difference in their everyday lives. And as Ben mentioned, we're here to talk about the prescription drug monitoring program audit. And I just want to take a brief moment to identify why, I mean, all of our audits are important, but some of them are deeply personal to me. And uh, in 2009, January of 2009, I was on, on winter break about to start my final semester of law school. And I got a call from my mom's boss uh, at the Glass House Tavern in Sandy, uh, on uh, Northeast Sandy in North Portland. And it was that my mom was in the ICU and she had overdosed on some combination of opioids and, and other things that, that she'd found and, and been given on the street and uh, was in the ICU. And so I rushed to the hospital and, and you know, found her husband in the, in the waiting room. And it turns out that they had been partying the night before and my mom had gone unconscious and he had been afraid that he was going to get in trouble. And so he didn't call the police or anybody and just left her there. And then thankfully, because a family member ended up uh, coming over in the morning to return something. They saw my mom unconscious and called the ambulance and she was able to get to Portland Adventist Hospital in time and ended up saving her life. And so this is an audit that's deeply personal for me because when we talk about the people in Oregon experiencing opioid overdoses, this is not statistics. These are not just numbers. These are people. You're somebody's mom or somebody's brother or somebody's uncle or somebody's kid. And so this is an audit that is about ultimately people and about how we can make a difference and uh, do better here in Oregon in helping people um, not be inflicted by the opioid crisis. And as we all know, the opioid crisis is a grave threat both here in Oregon and around the country. According to the Oregon Health Authority, Oregon has one of the highest rates of misuse of prescription opioids in the entire nation. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a minute. One of the highest rates of misuse in the entire nation. And OHA now estimates that five Oregonians die a week, five Oregonians a week from opioid related overdoses. And in 2020, 462 Oregonians died from unintentional opioid overdoses up from 280 deaths in 2019. And I wanna say again, in 2009, one of those could have been my mom and all of these numbers or somebody's somebody and they belong to somebody and they're somebody's family and uh, we need to do better. So this decades long tragedy that has been fueled by the opioid industry, including consultants, manufacturers, distributors and others. And in 2018, my predecessor, the late secretary Dennis Richardson and the Oregon Audits Division released an award winning audit of the prescription drug monitoring program, a tool designed to support the appropriate use of prescription drugs and prevent abuse. And in reading that audit and actually talking about that one quite a bit when I'm uh, working throughout our state, when people want to know what the audits division does, people think of audits, they think of their taxes or they think of kind of just number crunching. But one of the, the excuse me, one of the findings that really stood out to me in the audit from 2018 was that um, the prescription drug monitoring program at that time did not cover veterinary prescriptions. And the audits, our auditors here in Oregon were able to find that people were actually harming their pets on purpose and then taking their, their pets to the vet, getting a prescription opioid, and then using those opioids and, um, and using the, the opioids that the vets, the vets had prescribed for their pets, which is just a tragedy all around. Um, and that's the kind of important findings that the audits division is unable to uncover in their work. And in 2018, our auditors made 12 recommendations to improve the prescription drug monitoring program. In our follow-up report today that we are releasing, we found that only four recommendations have been fully implemented. And I will just say, that's not good enough. It is not. Legislative changes are needed to fully implement most of the outstanding recommendations. Those recommendations include areas such as data sharing, using the PDMP database and collecting further information Oregon's prescription drug monitoring program is an important tool, a very, very important tool to help address the prescription drug abuse and improve health outcomes for people here in Oregon, and we have to take full advantage of it. So that's why we're here today to call on the state legislators 
to pass the bills and the Oregon Health Authority to fully implement the remaining recommendations in this audit as soon as possible. Literally lives depend on it. And so I wanna thank the audits director, Kip Mehmet, and our team for their incredibly hard work and their professionalism. Our audits team takes great care adhering to strict standards of quality in all of our audits. And as I said, for this audit, they won the National Association of State Auditors Excellence in Accountability Award and influenced several other states to audit their PDMP program. So I'm really proud to work alongside this audits team and to give the people of Oregon the transparency and accountability that they expect from this office. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kip to introduce our audits team. Good morning. Thank you so much, Secretary Fay. And uh, good morning. My name is Kip Mehmet. I'm the Audit Director for the Secretary of State's Office. My pronoun nouns are he and his. And I really want to thank the Secretary for her support and her deeply moving personal story. And, you know, I'd just like to point out so many of us have those stories. My youngest brother or younger brother has had lifelong addiction issues. So many of us know that story and I've seen it directly. And so that's why I'm so proud of this audit and this work. Um, it really does address, as the Secretary laid out, one of our most prescient and pressing public health risk, likely um, has been exacerbated by the impacts of the pandemic and, and other things pressing on our, our culture and, and, and that, um, the, this is the environment we're in. And so we're really happy to present this follow-up report. This is part of our accountability process. We follow up on our audits. We just don't issue the audit and let them leave there. We actually follow up to show accountability and, and to give credit where credit's due too. Um, I'm really proud of this audit for a lot of reasons. Not only did it, it did it tackle this important issue, but it really used an advanced and multifaceted methodology uh, to really identify the significant risk with this program and then to also help develop some really good sound uh, recommendations. Particularly the, the methodology that we really deployed effectively is our sophisticated use of data analytics to really identify prescription trends and patterns and risk in the data that we were able to glean from the PDMP program. The, the secretary and Ben mentioned the awards. We, we, we're grateful for that recognition, but we obviously don't do these for awards. But the, the fact that we were able to influence other state auditors to take a look at this, including a Colorado state auditor who directly told me they did that audit because of our audit, and they actually found very concerning uh, issues with their program as well, and are actually moving a little bit more aggressively than I think our state is to address those. Uh, one interesting thing, and we'll get to your questions here, the methodology also identified what I call gold standard criteria. That's, that's kind of elusive in performance audits because states do things differently. These are complex issues. But in the case of PDMP programs, all 50 states administer them. And so we had a, and to the secretary's good point, not all states have as poor of outcomes as we have. And so when we were looking and doing this benchmark comparison, and the report is loaded with, with best practices, leading practices, and comparisons with Oregon's practices to show how other states are using their PDM programs to better combat this op opioid ep epidemic. And so what the secretary already noted and what I wanna emphasize is one, we're grateful to what OHA's already done. They've done some work as the follow-up report shows to implement recommendations. But frankly, most of the work needs to be done at the legislative level. Uh, Oregon, and we proved this pretty objectively, that it has one of the weakest statutory frameworks in the country over this area. And again, some of the poorest outcomes. So we think there's some real opportunity here uh, to really shore up and strengthen our opportunity uh, to, to look at this better from a state and to help doctors and prescribers and pharmacies and patients most importantly in this important area. The last thing I wanna note before I turn it over, uh, introduce the team and then turn it back to Ben for your Q&A is the U.S. District Attorney at the federal level was very interested in our work. They are obviously prosecuting and looking at opioid crimes and prescription crimes. They actually reached out to our office and requested some of our information, which we provided to them. Uh, we don't know, you know, we won't know if that helps their investigations or not, but because of the um, credibility of our evidence and the compelling nature of our evidence that there was some potential legal illegal activity around this, again, the U.S. Attorney. So, um, Lots of people, lots of impact uh, from this audit. And then finally, as the secretary noted in her comments, we continue and will continue our audit work in this area. And after this audit, we did execute an audit of the state veterinarian board and particularly with the scope of looking at opioid prescriptions for animals and pets and actually had some very significant findings in that report as well. And at some point, we'll be back to you to follow up on that. But without further ado, we wanna to get to your questions. I wanna introduce and thank the audit team. Ian Green is here who served as the audit manager and Karen Peterson uh, served as the lead auditor on this project. Uh, thank you again for being here and your interest. We welcome your questions and Ben, I'll turn it over to you for that uh, segment of the, of the program. 
Thank you, Kip, and thank you, Secretary Fagan. So for questions today, I'd ask that you use the hand raise function in Zoom uh, to get an order going. You can find that under the reactions button. Um, if you have any issues with that, feel free to drop a line in the chat as well. We could do it that way. Uh, and I'll just go in the order that I'm seeing folks. Uh, the first question being from Lynn at the Oregon Capital Chronicle. Lynn, go ahead. Thanks, Ben. Um, I have a couple of questions really uh, just about some language in the audit. One was it, it mentions um, that information should be shared with quote unquote stakeholders. Who, who are you talking about? Is that health license uh, boards and law enforcement? Karen, would you mind trying to tackle that one? And I can add at a higher level, but just the specifics of what the report actually said in that area. Kip, I'll actually jump in. Uh, yeah, that's who we were referring to. So the licensing board and the law enforcement arms uh, are key stakeholders in this. Okay, that was just a technical, do you mind, can I ask another one? A little more substantive, and that is that, um, so Oregon used to have the highest rate of prescription per capita. I can remember doing stories on this when I was at the Oregonian, but, and that's gone down. But now how much of the uh, opiate and drug epidemic is caused by prescriptions, uh, uh, misuse of prescriptions? Do you have any comment about that? Yeah, so uh, I was just looking at some statistics yesterday from the National Survey of Drug Use um, that the US Department of Health and Human Services puts together and Oregon ranks number one on prescription opioid misuse in the country. So the level of prescriptions that are given per capita in the state have gone down since the audit's been released, but we're still very high on a comparison to other states on where we rank in terms of a prescription opioid misuse. But but if if the legislature, I, I, I didn't ask that correctly, and, and this will you know let you go on to Ben, but um, if all these uh, recommendations were implemented, um, how, how much do you think that would help? Um, you know, I mean, the over, overall point really is the drug epidemic, right? So how much would that help, do you think? Do you have any idea of that? Thank you. So implementing the recommendations would certainly help. Um, it's, it's not going to prevent, you know, illegal tra trafficking of opioids and fentanyl from Mexico and other countries. That is certainly a major problem in our state um, and all along the I-5 corridor. Um, but it, it's still a sizable um, portion. I, I, I don't have the exact figures on top of my head, but I, I can look into that. Yeah, and I'll just add on top of that, it's a great question. And, and we certainly don't mean to imply that, you know, addressing this will, yeah, to Ian's point, you know, eliminate the risk or even to your point, a good question of how much of the of the risk is, is being take, taken by this. But it's just what we can do in our swim lane where the state has some ability to monitor this. And we did try to put that in context in the report. So yeah, this is not an end all be with all kind of solution to it. Obviously it's much more complicated than that, but we're just incrementally where are things that we think. And again, based not on what auditors think, but what other experts and states are doing to really combat this. Thanks, Kip, and thanks, Lynn. Uh, let's move along. Uh, the next hand I see is from Ben Botkin at the Lund Report. Ben, go ahead. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so I have kind of a two-part question. Um, one is, um, how much cooperation are you seeing from the health authority in implementing the guidelines that don't require legislation? And if there are any outstanding guidelines that don't require legislation that aren't yet in place, um, what are they? Thanks. So I'll, I'll tackle the, the first part of that question then. Um, in terms of the Oregon Health Authority, they were very proactive in implementing the recommendations that were, were within their control. Um, in response to the audit follow-up, they noted a number of items that they didn't have the authority to, to take action on the recommendations, and those are what require legislative action. And I, I think within the report, if you read the narrative, you'll see the details of which specific items require legislative action. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, moving along, next hand I see is from Kirsten at KBEL. Kirsten, go ahead. 
Hi, good morning. Um, so I have a question uh, related to current Oregon statute. How does current Oregon law prohibit uh, PDMP data from being shared to those stakeholders that we keep mentioning, like law enforcement and licensing boards? And as a follow-up, what bills are currently in the works in the legislature that address this audit's concerns? So in, in terms of legislative action, I'm not aware of anything. We're between sessions right now. Um, so a lot of the legislative concepts for the long session next year will be developed in this fall uh, kind of time period. Uh, Karen, can you speak to any of the, the details that Kirsten was asking about? Darren, if you're speaking, we, we can't hear you. You might still be on mute. It's possible Karen's uh, experiencing some issues. All right, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll circle back. I, I don't have those off the top of my head. I'll, I'll need to look into that some more. Thanks, Kirsten. I'll also say that, you know, our office is uh, presenting the information in the follow up report to legislators. And um, if there's anything that comes out of those conversations that gets to your question on legislative action, we'd be happy to follow up with you. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, the next hand I see is from Fedor at the Oregonian. Fedor, go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. So in the follow up report, um, it's stated several times that OHA is actively using appropriate channels to recommend legislative changes. How long has OHA been doing that? And can you describe in more detail exactly what it's been doing to uh, those appropriate channels? So uh, what they've been working on is, is relaying the limitations in their statute to the legislature um, and specific committees over there. Um, in terms of the budget making process, there's a requirement for agencies to submit uh, status updates on audits that they've had. So that's part of that communication channel as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Lynn, you still have your hand up as a follow-up question? Uh, sorry, no, I'll take it down. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, those are all the hands I see. Uh, does anyone else have any follow-up questions they'd like to jump in with here? We've got plenty of time still. Uh, Kirsten, I see you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Fedor. We can go to you and then Kirsten next. Sure, so I, I was wondering, could you, could you elaborate, and I'm sorry for the background noise, I wonder if you could elaborate, I mean, has the state uh, approached any lawmakers specifically to promote um, any changes to statute? And also, since when exactly has the state been making these reports on statutory limitations? I didn't catch the trail off end of the question there, but Ben, I'm happy to, to jump in. We So our legislative director in the Secretary of State's office has, as Ben mentioned, we're going to be presenting to legislators this audit shortly, but we've actually, our, our legislative director has actually reached out to legislators based on this follow-up to, to find out, uh, you know, if there would be bills being introduced and who the legislative champions would be for, to implement some of these statutory changes that are needed. What about o OHA specifically? I mean, what has OHA been doing with, with uh, on the uh, legislative front for the last four years? I don't, I'm not sure that we're prepared to speak to what their actions have been in. Is there anything in the follow-up report on that? I, I, I know we got some details around what actions they took. I don't know them off the top of my head, but we can go into our work papers to see what sort of evidence uh, were provided to our team that we evaluated. I'm oh, sorry. You're good. Yeah. I was just going to say, and, and definitely not speaking for OHA, but I, I have talked to their leadership and, and just in general about, and, and it's kind of a shift our office is making a little bit in terms of legislative recommendations through the agency, because I do believe they feel like they're limited and they have other legislative priorities as well that they're running with in such a large agency during a pandemic as well. So we are actually, to the Secretary's good point, engaging in a, in a lot more proactive um, legislative 
direct outreach strategy on some of these audits. So I would say it's fair to say, I think they worked uh, forward on the statutes as best as they feel they can in, in, in their bigger quiver. But I do think they also think they're limited in what they're able to do there. Um, and, and so, you know, haven't gone as far as we would have hoped, um, but with understanding of, of some of their limitations. Thanks, Kip. Thanks, Ian. Um, Kirsten, you were next. Well, uh, Secretary and Kip, you both mentioned that you guys have personal connections to this issue. Um, and I just wanted to know if you had a final message to lawmakers right now as to why they should take action uh, surrounding this audit in the near future, what would that be and what would that look like? What changes would you like to see? The changes I'd like to see are the changes that are recommended in the audit. This is work done by professionals that have looked at other states that don't have the same level of problem that Oregon does. And so I would certainly look to the audit. And again, to, to the point earlier, this is not the entire drug epidemic. This is one part of it. And our auditors, because of their professional standards, have to look at just one part. They can't go outside their scope. But the message I would just leave them with is that these are not numbers. These are people. These are people's parents and kids and uncles and brothers and siblings and friends and coworkers, and these are real lives at stake and if there's anything more important that we do as public servants in Oregon, it would be to take action to save the lives of the people of Oregon. And I can't top that great answer, but what I will say is this, I mean, it's right to the Secretary and my goal of transparency and public trust, and so I think one thing the audit revealed here there are legitimate discussions, and we put in the report about First Amendment rights and privacy rights here. We're not ignoring those. Other states don't ignore those. But in the end, we need more transparency. The data analysis we did was glaring. I, I really hope, as you read the report and the original report, the presentations we had are just shocking in some of the data analysis. And I'll, I'll credit our team. They did some great data analysis work, some sophisticated. But at the same time, it wasn't that sophisticated. And OHA certainly have the capability and, and technical expertise inside. So I think to, to the Secretary's good point about peoples, let's get more transparency and I think have a little bit more open and, and honest um, discussion about, about these risks here. There are no easy solutions. We're not pretending there are. But I think the more transparency and the more data you can put out there to help stakeholders and the public understand the risk and then put a people face on it's what we're going to try to do. And that's what we hope the outcome is. Thanks. I want to invite uh, anyone on the call who has additional questions to jump in at this point. We do have a couple more minutes. I want to make sure we get to everybody. Okay. Well, seeing nothing, I uh, just want to, again, thank everyone for, for jumping on here. Uh, um, I'll remind folks that uh, the recording of this event will be available. I'll email it out to everyone on our RSVP list uh, in a, um, you know, about an hour or so after I can download it and get it all set up. And then we'll also be uploading it to our YouTube page. Um, before we jump off, I uh, just want to invite anyone from our team, if they have any final comments they'd like to make to send us off. One comment I'd like to make is, you know, this isn't our last audit in this space. You know, we're currently doing an audit of Measure 110 and looking at substance use disorder and treatment services here in Oregon. We've got several audits planned on that. Um, one will be released later this fall as well as some in the coming years. So um, it's an issue that's important to all of us here. Great. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, everyone. Um, that'll do it for today. We'll uh, see you next time. Take care.